Dr. Sri Kumar. On the 1st of April 2021, IIA will complete 50 years and to mark this important milestone and to showcase past achievements of the Institute, we have planned a series of events, including symposium, workshops, science events, and more. So we have developed a dedicated web page for IA50 events to provide an easy interface for followers, well-wishers, and mentors of IA to keep abreast with the IA50 events. The website has several major attractions specifically aimed at the IA50 occasion. It also gives details of various programs and their schedules. So please do visit this website for updates and help us with your suggestions and ideas to make IA50 a great memorable event. May I now request Professor Annapurni, Director IIA, to launch this website. Uh, thank you, Aruna. So it's a pleasure for me to uh, launch the website put together by the team. So let me share the... Um, hope I find the place. Yeah, so I'm happy to share this. This is a basically a video put together. Uh, so this is the website. It is embedded in the main website at IA50. So it has, it, it, the front page shows the all the main facilities and the pictures of it and the path it has taken. And another page with the director's messages, so all the past director's messages, which were read out on the uh, Founders Day were also there and then the com commemorative lecture series. Um, what it is growing, so the website is developing and uh, being developed and all the events which are coming under this banner will be displayed there. So this, uh, this is a, one of the highlights is the online exhibition. So material from the archives are available for you to see through its IA through the years. So which is a very, uh, very nice one and sitting at your place of comfort, you can actually see the growth of IA. Uh, through the pictures, so that is uh, very nice. So this has got very different sections on uh, um, uh, golden memories, correspondences, total solar eclipses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, uh, it's a lot of interesting stuff actually. So you should go and see that. And uh, there's a creative corner where you have uh, various competitions, etc., and there's the organizing committee. Uh, there are also places where you can actually see the other logos which are put forward. So this is coming under IA50 logo as well as uh, under the DST50. So both the logos are available over there. So that's it. So and, uh, please do keep visiting this uh, website for uh, more information and updates on the uh, events unfolding through the year. Thank you. Please go ahead, Alna. Thank you, Anapurni. Okay. I now invite Dr. Sri Kumar to deliver his talk on looking ahead in space astronomy. Uh, Dr. Sri Kumar is an astrophysicist by training and is currently the Sati Savan Professor at ISRO and advisor to the Space Science Program Office at ISRO headquarters. After his BSc from University of Kerala and MSc in Physics from IIT Bombay, he pursued his PhD research on gamma ray astronomy at the University of New Hampshire, USA. His postdoctoral research focused on the emerging area of the observing the universe in gamma rays using NASA's Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. After a decade at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, he joined ISRO in 1999 to head the astronomy division at the ISRO Satellite Center. In 2013, he came to IIA as the director of this institute on deputation from ISRO. In 2018, he returned to ISRO as director of the Space Science Program Office until his superannuation in January 2020. Dr. Kumar's primary research interest varied over the years from the study of gamma rays to X-rays from cosmic sources composition of sun's corona to mapping of chemical elements on the lunar surface. As an experimentalist, his most recent involvement 
was in the design and development of X-ray mirrors for future space use. Welcome, Dr. Sri Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, Anapurni and other members of the IA family. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, 50 year celebration. Can you all hear me, first of all? Yeah, well, very well, yes. And uh, the screen is also visible? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so it's a real honor to be part of this uh, 50 year celebration, an important uh, milestone in any institute's history, and particularly with IAA. So today I'm going to spend a little time talking about some things that uh, we're all part of. And we are today in the process of trying to ask ourselves, how do we plan ahead in the context of the evolving uh, uh, programs in astronomy, in particular from the space flight. So let me begin with uh, um, the basics with regard to the fact that, you know, prior to the space age, we always had access on ground and astronomy flourished uh, with visible bands certainly being available on ground. We had a few limited windows in infrared that could be observed from ground. And of course, radio astronomy beyond a certain wavelength range, beyond say 30 megahertz was always visible from ground. And in the interim, we've also managed to use very advanced techniques that takes, took care of some of the problems of the atmosphere, particularly adaptive optics to address the refraction in the atmosphere and today we also address uh, coronagraphy, you know, trying to look at uh, fine structures, doing high resolution imaging, uh, in particular solar, in trying to look at uh, high contrast imaging, where you can actually remove the, uh, the, the parent uh, star for looking for exoplanets and so on. And if amplitude and phase information is available, as is often done in radio astronomy, uh, aperture synthesis and interferometry techniques have been very, very effectively utilized. Today we see this uh, slowly creeping up in frequency down from infrared and coming to optical and so on. So ground does provide a substantial capacity to do a lot of the science as the uh, practicing scientists desire. And, uh, but taking a closer look at these bands and you can actually see these bands in infrared where there are points where, uh, or, or small regions of this electromagnetic spectrum where the transmission, atmospheric transmission is getting pretty close to 100% or at least 60-70%, and that is a fairly good place to pursue these things. But the, if you look at the infrared uh, below uh, optical into the radio submillimeter and uh, part of the spectrum, you see there is a fair number of regions that are affected by water and oxygen absorption bands, and that makes us look for sites that are, have very low water rate content and also sort of limits the kind of science you can really do, but in principle doable with some of these restrictions put into us. And of course, below say 10 megahertz, you really have this ionosphere in front of us in, in, in between, which actually prevents us from actually seeing the universe at uh, very low frequencies. And so now there are new uh, proposals out there and uh, approved missions which are trying to look at uh, the radio universe at very low frequencies. Now, looking at the highest, uh, higher frequencies beyond an ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays, what you really see is uh, uh, the atmosphere really gets in the way. And of course, you can use balloon platforms to go up to say 40 kilometers, where you can actually see, um, really use balloon platforms to pursue X-rays and gamma ray astronomy and ultraviolet, ultraviolet even harder. But the problem with these are these platforms are not stable; they are limited in time, and uh, as you go to these higher energies. Your photon fluxes come down, so you really need, you really do not have the integration time required to look for high sensitivity observations. So uh, it is uh, the atmosphere really does get in the way. Now, to really discuss the broadband applications or uh, requirements that I want to address, I just thought I'd pick two themes to really address it, and that would be looking at the spectral energy distribution, which we, which is really looking at the uh, intensity distribution across wavelengths uh, to really understand the nature of the processes involved in point sources. And the second one would be into, in case of a really diffuse emission, uh, uh, which would maybe of galactic origin or maybe of extra galactic origin. Uh, both these things require broadband uh, coverage and uh, we'll use those as an example to carry the discussion forward. Uh, here is a, a spectral energy distribution of uh, stellar populations, young and old. What you see is uh, the, the difference arising from the fact that 
uh, the older star, older systems do not have large number of hot stars, you actually see the difference. So a spectral energy distribution gives you a, a capacity to really understand the system much better. Here is a case of a, of a, of a galaxy where you're actually seeing not just the fact that there is broad coverage, there is also the fact that many instruments have to be involved in filling up an ACD because it, it spans often many orders of magnitude. That's an important uh, question to address as we look at uh, having broadband coverage across a complete electromagnetic spectrum. In the case of active galaxies, which is this is a traditional approach of doing things, and you have many people uh, pursuing this. Uh, and what we see, all the way from radio up to gamma rays, you are really trying to do these things. And uh, this is a particular example where you have even astrosat uh, data uh, being used to constrain these models. But you can see a very large breadth of uh, wavelength to be covered in order to really address the core science we really want to do. And that's really an important point that we have to keep in mind. On the diffuse emission that we that I wanted to discuss, we see this is a, just a cartoon, really, of the complete electromagnetic spectrum diffuse emission. Uh, this is a well-known cosmic microwave background peak, but there are equivalent diffuse emission that you see all the down, stretching all the way down to the high energies in the gamma rays, radio to gamma rays. This is clearly an important question to ask in terms of what is the origin of this, of this emission. Uh, the most famous and the well-studied component is the microwave background, uh, which we now know. It's beginning with Kobe, with WMAP, now with Planck. We really have an incredible wealth of information regarding the nature of this, uh, uh, of the both the thermal uh, map as well as the differential map, which actually in turn is giving us a lot of details on constraining uh, models and here is a clean uh, uh, a result that has come from the plan mission that really shows how beautifully we understand theory and models seems to fit really well uh, over various angular scales only beyond about six degrees you start having some uncertainties in the parameters but it's really an impressive uh, uh, thing to really see such incredible match between theory and, uh, and uh, observations and this is purely of something of diffuse origin and a link to the early universe at the other end of the spectrum, you really have a spectrum from X-rays to gamma rays, uh, which are uh, spread across and, uh, and every new mission continues to add um, new measurements of this diffuse emission. When even the very early things that I was involved in 1998 with the Compton Gamma Observatory, uh, we find that uh, with every new mission, the spectrum keeps changing. And part of the reason is because you're now dealing with the uh, a, a wavelength regime where the angular resolutions are really poor compared to what you are familiar with in optical and radio. So source confusion is a serious concern. And as the sensitivity of the, of the systems improve, as the points per function in these energy bands get better, each mission appears to be able to do better in terms of removing what are point source contribution and then trying to look at the X residual diffuse emission. The question still remains in these bands. Uh, the extra, extra, extra background has been studied for quite extensively. Current uh, capacity with like Chandra, which has about half a half second angular resolution, uh, we're making a lot of headway with regard to understanding uh, point source emission from diffuse. But nevertheless, even at this stage, we're still not very sure whether what we call as a diffuse emission spectrum stretching from soft X rays all the way to very high energy gamma rays arises from. Uh, uh, a truly diffuse component or is really nothing but unresolved point sources limited largely by your instrument uh, capabilities. So this is a question that will continue to plague us for some more time. So access from space, which actually then opens up the regime, uh, the window to be looked at ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, astronomy, and, uh, and gamma rays beyond a few hundred GE, we come back from space back to ground because we believe it is too expensive and too challenging, too difficult to really set up a, a detector system that can actually stop, you know, a TeV photon uh, and provide a reasonable detectable signal that can be used from a space platform. So we come back to Earth and actually use atmosphere as, well as a detection medium. So it really opens up uh, the windows for UV, X-rays, and gamma rays. Infrared spectral band is now fully open. You really can do. You're not limited by the water vapor absorption bands. And uh, you also have this capacity to look at the submillimeter and micro bands, which are also troubled by water vapor uh, absorption features. 
and of course below 30 megahertz uh, we in principle do not have this ionospheric limitation and that is a very important to look at you know electrons that are uh, that are well past this acceleration phase but still energetic enough to really produce emission and we really like to understand the distribution of such uh, uh, low energy electrons in the universe radio astronomy which has actually uh, always flourished um, with on ground uh, is also not plagued by uh, man made issues in, in particular fm stations and, you know, or rfi radio frequency interference and this is a real concern and now there is very serious uh, look at uh, trying to say well we need to get to a place where the radio interference is very very small and clearly one of the places that has been talked about quite extensively and now being taken quite seriously is the far side of the moon uh, which really allows us to um, be shielded from the earth-based rfi interference uh, this is non-trivial because you know to get a mission to moon to astronomy uh, uh, appeared uh, difficult to justify, but uh, in the last few years, we've seen a large number of activity linked to the possibility of doing this uh, from the far side of the moon. There is a whole new group now working on astronomy from the uh, far side of the moon, and that's really an important area that uh, I see expanding quite a bit in the coming decade. So, what we are now looking at is the re real need for all frequencies, coverages, and all sky coverage all weather coverage and in this context um, uh, space and the use of space platforms really uh, have a very dominant role to play. And just to take a quick summary of uh, or a quick look at all the various missions that are out there uh, this is a very incomplete set I just put some uh, things together to get a, get a broad spectrum of the kind of things that are out there Hubble Space Telescope of course now nearly 30 years of service of course, multiply serviced, uh, you know, the insights have been completely revamped. Uh, Hubble itself doesn't know what it is today because all the instruments have changed. But Hubble has done a major, uh, with a small 2.4 meter class mirror, this has done interesting and very incredible, really incredible work to look at astronomy. The new missions out there on for exoplanets tests, which is now uh, finished one survey of the of the of the sky one part of the survey she the new ESA mission for exoplanets then in the x-ray regime you have the chandra which again continues to be out there for many many years for it's been decades exam newton another big uh, large collecting area telescope and the more focused instruments like swift and new star uh, astrosat which is now nearly about to complete five years and the very recent uh, inclusion of the spectrum rondin gamma mission uh, where uh, there is a very interesting EOCETA telescope uh, which actually has uh, really brought in a whole new revolution in soft x-ray uh, astronomy and they're all out there doing fantastic work and the highest energy is in terms of Agile, the Italian mission uh, for gamma rays still uh, uh, sort of uh, surviving but Fermi of course is now very heavily used Fermi is a scanning mode is able to do Sky, cover the sky every three hours so you really can get uh, uh, a measure of the gamma ray sky to look for transients and this has been very effective uh, uh, to look at the highest energy gamma rays from, from space and in the solar side there's been a lot of work uh, in particular the, with the launch of the solar parker probe and uh, solar orbiter from the european space agency we really got uh, brilliant missions out there and i'm sure uh, our community solar astronomers are quite excited and uh, not only are we observing sun from far with parker we are actually getting us very close and these are really uh, important missions and the solar orbiter looking at the sun from a different vantage point a very important uh, uh, component in understanding the the uh, both processes as well as the the, the angular spread of uh, of, of uh, the solar wind itself in terms of its composition in terms of these other plasma parameters, et cetera, that one can study using such a such a orbit uh, that the solar orbit is currently in. So there are missions that cover a wide range of uh, 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 science areas in astronomy right now. And uh, um, in those upcoming missions, I see again an incomplete list, but we certainly have a, a much anticipated James Webb telescope in 21, the renamed uh, W1st Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope in 1025. Next rays, we have the, the Japanese uh, JAXA had actually lost the 
he told me mission is revived in the form of extreme and then you have Athena, big plan for quite some time, a major mission to 31, Euclid, Plato, Ariel for planetary, for exoplanet work, spectroscopy of the atmospheres, and of course the big LISA mission, now that the LISA Pathfinder mission uh, demonstrated successfully and uh, beyond expectations, the ability to really uh, address the technology challenge of a gravitational wave mission from space, LISA is on a strong uh, path to really uh, getting it being achieved. And there are many such missions coming up. So it's a big spectrum of missions that we're now seeing globally. So in that context, well, let's take a look at uh, space astronomy in India. We, of course, started from a very modest manner. Uh, in the 80s, we had a soft series of satellites. And uh, uh, once the rockets have, uh, stabilized, and this uh, played an important role in the early gamma ray burst uh, localization uh, uh, challenge that was uh, confronting the world, where you needed multiple spacecraft to really locate where these gamma ray bursts were coming from. And SROS had some early detections, limited lifetime, but it has some early detections. But then it led to the ability to really uh, develop X ray instruments for uh, a piggyback, uh, as a piggyback payload on IRSP3 in the mid 90s, um, where uh, TFR and uh, uh, ISRO were involved in this thing. And this was, of course, a trigger for as a precursor for Astrosat as a major observatory. Uh, in between 2003, you had a small piggyback mission called SOX for solar X-ray astronomy, uh, X-ray in particular looking for flares, broadband covering from soft X-rays to hard X-rays. And, but this was the first venture that we had made in the solid state X-ray detectors. Still, we, of course, had flown proportional counters. And this is the first time we had solid state X-ray detectors. Some of it was repeated on the RT2 mission, on the Photon Coronas mission with the, with the Russians, which actually had a very interesting imaging cap capability, frontal zone plate imaging capability. Unfortunately, the mission did not have a short life because the spacecraft had a problem and we didn't have enough um, flaring events where we could actually demonstrate the frontal zone plate imaging, but would have been very interesting. But it was an interesting opportunity. New set of players came in. Center for Space Physics in Calcutta had a major involvement in that. And by then, in 2015, we had our first dedicated astronomy observatory. So it has been a slow but steady march to from simple to complex instruments and to and a full-scale observatory class mission. And so today, we are at a fairly uh, uh, mature phase with regard to addressing uh, uh, both Indian as well as global science interests using dedicated astronomy satellites. The slide on Astrosat is warranted, of course, uh, where IAA has also played a very important role. And uh, it had pre-project funding, which was a very interesting thing. I think at that time, with support of the then chairman of this show, there was pre-project funding made available to the payload teams, uh, which is, uh, these days, it's difficult to get such funding early, but that actually helped us uh, develop instruments ahead of time, uh, well before the formal project was actually put in place. It took us some time to complete, various complexities, and there were many hard, uh, institutions involved in hardware outside these resources, which is very, very important. It's been five years in running, good performance, good results, and you know, two weeks ago, you heard this wonderful result uh, that uh, from UBIT observations. Uh, UBIT, which uh, led by IAA, had actually delivered this beautiful instrument that has uh, incredibly uh, low noise and uh, had uh, high angular resolution, uh, which, uh, and over the last five years, had maintained a level of cleanliness that actually allowed its uh, detection efficiency to remain steady, and has now resulted in such very important, interesting results. But in pursuing this, there were a fairly large number of challenges. You know, this uh, experiment uh, on the proportional counters required large area, not an easy thing to build. You can build small proportional counters, but large ones, stable, is non trivial. We had the large set of of, of semiconductor compounds, semiconductors, cad cadmiums in telluride arrays for hard X-ray detection, uh, soft X-ray mirror, X-ray optics was introduced for the first time, and um, there was also the first time we had X-ray CCD-based detector development, large UV optics, and not just optics, uh, detector structure, coating, contamination, alignment, everything, um, stable time references, and uh, we pretty much built the spacecraft around the payload, around the AT in large sense. That is an uh, important thing, and it's an important thing, a unique thing for astronomy. <coughs> Sorry. 
um, because the spacecraft was built around the need of the, of the experimenters. Uh, in spite of severe constraints on the sun and the moon and all these angle constraints of each payload, which makes a, a challenge to really run the observatory on a daily basis, and many times we can't target a certain target of interest for one experiment because of constraints of other experiment, but things have moved very well. We also had a window for what I call target of opportunity. These are interruptions for sure, but we really wanted to make sure that capacity to really uh, to, to, to be agile with regard to uh, uh, new opportunities that open up when there is an uh, IAU telegram, an astronomical telegram suggesting interesting changes in some source, or from sky monitors, we should be in a position to tackle it. And we've had very interesting results from many of these target of opportunity interruptions. And the nice thing about the target of opportunity data is that data goes public and people are able to use it very quickly. Proposal-driven observations were for the first time we had actually taken up uh, uh, under AstroSat and the challenge, but collectively, I think we pulled it off. Uh, it takes time. There are here and there issues are still there, but I think uh, we really managed to not only involve uh, astronomers in India, but astronomers and colleagues from other parts of the world as well. And the project coordination, not trivial, strong personalities, which are very important and necessary, and committed teams that really helped us to really pull it off together and numerous qualification challenges, but we really managed to pull it off. So we look at the current set of observing uh, orbiting science missions, which we really have on, on science areas, we call, though the Mars orbiter mission is uh, primarily a technology demonstration, uh, we, have, we have that uh, still going around Mars, AstroSat is there, and Chandrayaan-2, uh, the orbiter going around Moon doing fairly well. There are a few anticipated missions that are already approved by the government for funding, and this includes a small polarimetry mission, uh, X-ray polarimetry, after nearly 40, 40 years, I think, we are actually having another dedicated polarimetry mission. Uh, Aditya L1, where IA has a major role and a uh, very important mission is coming up. And uh, a follow-up to Chandrayaan-2 is Chandrayaan-3, anticipated in 2021. And after that is a series of missions, some of which I'll discuss in some detail in the coming slides, um, exploration of the moon, uh, and then uh, mission of possible orbit to Venus, and, uh, and and we'll discuss that in a minute. So that's where we are in terms of an overall perspective. Coming back to our core interest in astronomy for uh, the point of discussion today, I just wanted to use one of these uh, in the limited time that we have to really highlight a few things. I've now shown here is an X-ray catalog uh, that I just assembled in terms of a number of sources uh, from the days of 1971 Uhuru, the first dedicated X-ray astronomy satellite was launched <coughs> from Kenya. Uh, we had only 339 sources at that time. And as, as the years went by, the number of sources have really, really increased. And to take a look at the fact that XMM in 2008 had a number that was uh, close to 200,000. And then with the various release of its catalogs has crept up after nearly, you know, more, more than 20 years of uh, of uh, uh, existence, it actually has come up to now something close to 800,000. Eurosita, which just completed a year, has now been able to pull up a million sources. And Eurosita survey is expected to be a large number of sources. So the point I want to emphasize is the fact that um, doing astronomy or doing dedicated uh, focus science with individual sources, that time uh, may no longer be viable. We are really have to look at classes of sources and large scale surveys, and there's a real need to really respond to such opportunities that are emerging. So, that's a very important thing as we look at new programs. Here is an image, a beautiful image of the extra universe coming from Eurocita, uh, and it's just started the program. So, really exciting uh, times ahead. And there are colleagues from IEA who are also part of this uh, program, uh, the Eurocita program. So it's in that context that we look at the uh, space astronomy programs that we could address in, in future from India. These are all programs under consideration. Um, in response to a, an ounce of opportunity that was uh, put out, I think, in, I think in February, March of 2018, um, there were many responses and then the, the committee had shortlisted some of them. And we have a few that have been that have matured to a point where we can put this under a shortlist under consideration. That includes uh, this program called INSIST, 
uh, maybe jointly with the Canadian collaborators uh, on a mission called Castor, maybe a combined mission, uh, of course, led by IAEA here on the spectroscopy high resolution imaging in ultraviolet. Uh, uh, Annapurni can give a lot more details on what that is all about, but it's a very exciting mission coming up. It's a good follow up to our current UBIT mission. ExoWorlds has been proposed uh, primarily by the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology in Srivanandapuram. Uh, they, they are interested in looking at spectroscopy of exoplanet atmospheres to uh, identify uh, compositional aspects of these atmospheres. This is a very um, ambitious mission looking at a large optics. Uh, right now, converging something like 1.7 meter aperture, uh, but uh, demanding a large number. Both these uh, missions will demand uh, very high stable pointing at some level or some way to correct for drift and jitter in the platform. Uh, maybe fine guidance sensors have to be, systems have to be put in place. Uh, but these are challenges coming away, but these are right now under consideration. We also have a, an interesting um, quick uh, mission proposed by IIT Bombay, uh, led by IIT Bombay on uh, looking at the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave merger events. As, you, as we're all aware, gravitational wave is daily running the show with regard to exciting new discoveries. And uh, one of the key uh, questions we really have to address is in terms of the, of, the, of the initial flash that you'd expect to see in some of these mergers in X-rays. And the idea of an all scale monitor for that is what has been considered in X-ray. And uh, we also have interest in this, um, there's proposals that suggested that we could really look at the at, uh, low frequency signatures of the uh, epoch of reionization signatures that uh, there was a reported uh, detection of a, of a spectral signature around 70 megahertz. Of course, this requires this high sensitivity instrument in measurement. And ideally, this is one of those that require uh, going, uh, going to the uh, far side of the far side of the moon to really Make these measurements with, uh, where you're not affected by radio frequency interference from Earth. Uh, quite a challenging thing. Um, there's been a lot of effort going on in ground. With regard to proving that these sensitivities can indeed be achieved, and the question really is to find an opportunity to have such uh, programs, uh, such experiments uh, on a lunar orbiting spacecraft. And X ray astronomy, which has uh, often uh, been a key player in our space astronomy program. Um, we are, I mean, there is interest from uh, groups within ISRO, with PR and RRI to really look at uh, broadband X-ray polarimetry. The current uh, polarimetry mission, ExpoSat, is uh, fairly modest with regard to its coverage, uh, whereas here the idea is to build on that and, uh, and take it to a high, high sensitivity broadband, going from very soft X-rays to all the way to hard X-rays with regard to polarimetry. Uh, this, of course, has India gelled into a concrete proposal yet, and we are awaiting inputs from the community with regard to this issue. So, but these are just a few of the possible uh, uh, astronomy missions that are under consideration. And uh, we are hoping that, uh, you know, in a year's time, we will really have much better clarity with regard to both uh, getting formal approvals on some of them and uh, early funding from the project uh, formation side. Now we put this all together as part of a uh, single slide here, which on the left side, what you see is the current operation facilities. It includes both ground and space. And uh, on the right side, uh, we are trying to show that these are, that are planned uh, programs. These planned programs stretch all the way from uh, um, our current time scale of 2020 to about 2030 or so. And at the bottom, we also So we also have the LIGO India program as establishing a third LIGO laboratory in India. Um, and in the, on the annual are the Charango Telescope Array involvement being discussed, the National Large Solar Telescope, uh, and the National Large Optical Telescope all coming through. Uh, these are really important missions, and there is a real need to really blend it all together. And if you look at this total picture that we have in front of us, we truly have uh, a, a golden era astronomy is set in India with regard to opportunities for students, young researchers and faculties in actually trying to do astronomy um, across, across wave bands, across uh, 
uh, and across the themes that are of interest to the emerging students uh, in various institutions in the country. So quite an exciting time. And the space component sort of blends in um, suitably with that. It's very clear to us today that we need to really ensure that there is a strong linkage between ground and space, and that needs to be brought into uh, as, as strongly as possible with regard to, to ensure uh, the best science comes out of these programs. Now, one area I want to really just uh, spend uh, two minutes on is on the area of telehealth astronomy. It's a new field in the area of this, uh, being, uh, being discussed globally. Also, we haven't had too many. Of course, ALMA as a as a new facility that's come up recently has done tremendous work with regard to um, both very high angular resolution imaging as well as sensitivity, which actually allows us to do very, very interesting science. Uh, typically observes in about 10 bands, uh, going from about 30 gigahertz to about 1,000 gigahertz. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, water vapor does trouble terahertz astronomy from ground. However, uh, the site in Chile, uh, some sites in Hanley, in, in Ladakh, could actually be very useful for us to pursue ground based terahertz astronomy. What is interesting is there's been a development at the Space Application Center in Ahmedabad where uh, there's a group uh, interested in developing terahertz uh, detector systems, um, and they've been in discussion with the Center for uh, Astrophysics, the Harvard Smithsonian Center, uh, who have, uh, of course, are running the submillimeter array in Hawaii and are involved in both the uh, uh, Event Horizon Telescope program and others uh, to really collaborate uh, with them in the development of, uh, of a very sensitive detector system. Uh, in particular, the SIS, the superconducting, insulator superconducting systems, the tunnel junctions, really, uh, which are very critical to really measure both, uh, both the map out carbon monoxide as well as uh, the carbon transitions, uh, which are expected in the hundreds of gigahertz regime. So there is a project that is currently underway to really look at the uh, build a six meter telescope in Hanley. I think IA uh, has kindly agreed to enable the establishment of such a facility in that way. Um, and uh, right now the dialogue is on to really uh, take this through between the Science Space Application Center and the Center for Astrophysics in our Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics uh, for a six meter telescope, which is a very important thing. And um, so we here is a very uh, useful merger where there is a group uh, who's very keen to really work on the technology component of it. And for the science community in India, this is a great chance to really leverage it maximally to really ensure that a new facility in, in Tarakas astronomy is built up. And what we so believe at the medium scale term plan would be join at some point the, uh, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope Network, which I just put a dot here in India. I hope that will be part of this thing. But of course, there's still a lot of challenges still left for us to get to that scale, but that is certainly a medium term goal. And the long term goal would be to really put in, think about uh, Tarakas uh, uh, space mission. Now, uh, uh, this could be in the decade that follows, but we have a lot of work to do. And I think uh, there, is an, there is an informal group put together. In January, there was a meeting at RRI called the Indian sub millimeter Astronomy Consortium. And uh, together, we could actually take this forward with regard to uh, as a new facility for the Indian astronomy. So now we'll come to my last point. Uh, discussion here. I just want to emphasize a few points here. Uh, programs in India have certain strengths, and that is, uh, these are my personal views on it. Uh, it's a growing research community, uh, and there are a lot of motivated uh, uh, st uh, students and researchers available. They are willing and interested in pursuing front ranking science, and they're touched with global efforts because, as you know, the, 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 uh, the global reach has now changed quite a bit. The family of collaboration programs. So we need to put access for the space platform from India for scientific investigations. That's very important. If you look at the, the challenge to get a mission up in space in the US, uh, we really have a much easier access to space. There is significant support from ISRO towards realization of science, of science experiments, and even an astro side. There's a large amount of technical elements that were done and joined in this road. That's a good thing. And then there is a very important thing, I think, at least in so far, we haven't had the issue of where once it's improved, uh, midway through, or the you know, 90% of the way through, they say, sorry, we decided to, the cost escalation or lack of budget, we just can't run the program. 
So right now we don't have this sort of possibility of that the fate of the approved programs are hinged till last minute on available funds. So that's a good thing. Uh, it, of course, this could change in the new financial scenario of the country. But as of now, these are strengths for the program. There are some weak areas, and these are my personal views. Um, in my view, future programs are to be evolved using a combination of, of various debates, debates at various levels uh, between the user community, the interested scientists who really want to do it, uh, as well as the technology groups as well, to, and they must justify signs of national interest, of global relevance, address resource availability, you know, sometimes great science and we can always say, but then we just we don't know where to really position to because of technology gaps in terms of some other issues that may be there, or financial in some cases, very expensive missions. So we have to really blend that, all that into and then create and link that to some long-term vision plan. And in all of these areas, I think there is room for improvement. We have very certainly been having a lot of dialogues with uh, uh, various groups in the country, but I believe uh, there is still room for improvement in many of these areas. But that's something we really need to enhance. Second point is while there is, is a role of students, while there's been a growing involvement of PhD students in using data from space missions, and I think in solar physics, it's a huge increase. The other day when there was a discussion we found um, to as a research, uh, but it's still limited. It's still limited for what we could be involved in. And that's very important because the, that's a solid training that a PhD student gets as part of being part of a program uh, will lend beautifully into the future programs of the countries to take up when they join as faculties and researchers at various institutes. So this is actually today limiting our ability to fully exploit the relative ease of access to space. Uh, we were just trying to take a head count on how many PhDs came out of AstroSat. And of course, we're not sure this is the actual number, but um, people are still sending in inputs, but it is not, uh, it is less than 20. And that's a concern. That's a concern. We should, of course, there will be many more will come. But the point I want to emphasize is they should also be involved in the development of science instruments. That really means uh, uh, the value of being part of that. And I think today, when we are now part of the mega projects, it's very easy to see how, how critical such training would be uh, as we get involved in such international programs in the future. But I think enhancing that would be a very valuable thing. A third point I want to emphasize is the fact that uh, while we build instruments, we, we don't give as much emphasis on calibration of instruments. Um, so sometimes, uh, often, uh, instruments are, are built to spec, but science is limited because we have not been able to calibrate it very well. In other words, we must have the ability to translate the measurements into core science with small error bars. That means understanding the instrument very well. So the calibration activity really needs focus, requires um, sometimes uh, specialized involvement in early phases, and then sustaining that uh, capability and growing it over the years as we also build uh, new and challenging instruments. So some areas to be addressed quickly, in my view, would be the involvement of PhD students, I've discussed that, and then create this strong link between uh, theory, modeling work, and experiments being conducted. Integrated approach. Theorists should be part of proposals. They must not be people who come in after the mission has been launched. Um, and uh, mature technologies often give you a new opportunity to do an experiment that we didn't do earlier, we couldn't do earlier. The use of uh, maybe not necessarily space qualified systems, but uh, there are ways to really um, qualify them. I know you would run into the difficulty from colleagues and ISRO who would say, no, 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 this is not space qualified, so we can't do it. But as you have, as many of you have worked with this for over the years, you have noticed there are ways to really sometimes upscale them for space use, and that actually allows us to really bring in more recent technology to achieve your science goals. Uh, and so we should have a greater focus on end results than on just the process of building. In the process of building, we're doing some, but we really need to make sure the end results are really the larger focus. And of course, in terms of managing projects, I think we need an efficient, inclusive project management system that not just, not just registry, but also at individual institutes that actually part of it. So I see lots of changes in that. That's very good. And we should really be able to do project, future projects better. But clearly, uh, today, uh, it is not an easy job to manage, and especially when the collaboration is not just within the country, but even from outside. Uh, so that is an equally important thing as building hardware and software. 
So just again, I'm flashing the same picture just to remind you the challenge out there, the opportunities out there, and that we could really do it if we can bring in some small corrections to uh, existing systems, and that will allow us to really meet the, uh, meet, meet the challenges uh, that are getting, that, that are necessary to be addressed to get to our goal. I just want to leave you with one of these interesting results that have come from ALMA. You know, many of you will remember Supernova 1987A. Uh, I recall uh, Professor Kausik uh, discussing the handful of neutrinos that came from this that we detected. And being not far away, 60 kiloparsec is not far off at all. It's in our backyard. It was a great thing. Over the years, the Hubble Space Telescope has been monitoring the expansion of the shell and the beautiful pictures showing the periodic uh, changes uh, that have actually happened in this. And uh, this detection by ALMA of this, of this uh, elusive neutron star is a very interesting result. I do not know much more about it, but I thought it was exciting stuff. And what it tells you is this, you know, persistence and it pays off and we, we these are opportunities that come up and we really need to build it in the context of this larger vision that we're looking at. So let me just close with this slide that says today, IA has a broad base in astronomy. IA has a strong base in space instrumentation and the use of space data. I see a large number of uh, students and faculties involved in these things. A deep involvement in front ranking ground experiments, example, TMT, and the early experience with building ground-based telescopes. We have a large student base. And in particular, I think the program that uh, um, Professor Hassan uh, had brought in along with Professor Saha and others that in particular this MTech PhD program in astronomical instrumentation, which lends a lot of capacity for us to really do uh, high-end instrument design, development, calibration, and so on. The Bangalore connection to ISRO is very useful, as well as to industries and other institutes. I think at the end of the day, if you want to really get certain things done, uh, access to industries in the, in the neighborhood is very important. And of course, you also have fantastic facilities at the MGK and the laboratory, the new optics laboratory can be at Crest. You have an infrastructure that is already in place and a team that is already experienced with UBIT, now with Aditya and so on. So IAA, I would look at it as India's Institute of Astrophysics. And so has excellent scope for major role in future space astronomy programs nationally and globally. And I hope to really see a large number of programs at the Institute of Technology. So let me close congratulating the IA family. Last 50 years, a lot of things have been achieved, and I'm sure many exciting results are coming our way. Thank you. Uh, Srikumar, I have a question. This is Arun Mangalam. Yes, Arun. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just I have a throw them all out and you can answer them. First of all, what is the AstroSat story? What is that? What have we learned from it? Putting all the instruments on the same uh, uh, platform mm. in in, retros in retrospect, is it a good idea? Yeah. So, yeah. Secondly, uh, uh, another question is: I think I probably asked you this before. I don't remember. Uh, optical telescope in space, right? In terms yeah. of cost, in terms of you know the cost benefit ratio. Uh, and the fact that, you know, we are st still struggling to get uh, into the large telescope program, but we can still, you know, beat it in terms of, uh, probably not in terms of resolution, but at least uh, avoid this AO story and other things. And uh, besides just looking at various programs, space, meet, space astronomy versus ground-based astronomy and other things, uh, do we have... Uh, an overall synergy in place in terms of uh, different wavelengths, uh, the targets we're looking at. Uh, so we should be looking at, at building facilities in different wavelengths in some kind of cohesive manner. So that we have, uh, you had one of these plots, I think I, in one of your earlier lectures, I saw that a synergy plot uh, where uh, different uh, in interesting uh, sources or ones that are of importance like past radio bursts or transients, uh, we have to have a multifaceted uh, approach. You know, you can't just design one instrument and forget about the other wavelengths. There seems to be a lot of lack of synergy, especially when it comes to transients. 
so I just leave you with these uh, okay. questions. You give me a lot of questions. <laughs> Let me start with the first one, as to that story, or whether it was a good idea to have all on our platform. Um, this is a complex uh, uh, question. Um, way back in 2001, I think, when we had a big review at TAFR where uh, Professor Parao, I think, was there to ask the same question, should we, should this be on two different platforms or so one? We had argued strongly that the need for simultaneous multi multi uh, coverage is very crucial. I think that the argument still remains. Now, the problem, if there is any, would be more in terms of implementation issues. We actually had uh, um, constraints arising because of the fact that the UV um, requires short exposure, UV has uh, other constraints compared to the X-rays. And so there are, you know, difficulty of looking at the plane of the galaxy where, uh, in the galactic plane where many of the X-ray uh, sources are um, for those who are studying galactic astronomy, while UV IT would like to avoid the galactic plane. Now, what we've meshed together, I think, a program that is uh, not as successful as we thought it would be, but it certainly still managed to pull off uh, uh, some of the multivariant uh, success stories, though the results do not necessarily show a large fraction of multivariant science coming out of it. And that, I think, could change in the next few years because now there is a greater thinking about both in relaxing certain constraints as well as looking at uh, key projects that could actually be uh, more relevant for some of the multivariant studies. But clearly there has been severe difficulties because of the challenges of, of instruments across a broad spectrum with different requirements, and that has led to this issue. So it may be true that in future, we may or may not be in a position to really create such platforms and justify it, as uh, in particular as we go into high sensitivity regimes, uh, higher angular resolution requirements, greater platform stability requirements because of imaging capacity on uh, for uh, for UV instruments and so on, which are far, far greater than what is demanded by the current X-ray telescopes and that we are now building. So my view would be that in future, we may be seeing, we may not have so many on a single platform. And it also may be a good idea to do such things too in order to ensure that we have uh, early missions coming at faster rates and keeping the community alive and active uh, as opposed to waiting for very long periods of time to put all of that together. Now, a second question on optical telescope in space and cost-benefit ratio. I mean, I've discussed this with uh, colleagues uh, at IEA as well as at IUCA and many other places. Uh, in general, clearly, any space mission is expensive. Um, it can cost uh, a, a decent optical telescope at the level of maybe sub two meter class telescope up in space could take us in the regime of about a thousand crore project, and that is non trivial. Um, at smaller apertures, can be the cost can be brought down, but you are still looking at a very large investment. So, the justification you have to provide for that has to be substantial um, in the context of uh, science justification. So, that's where the goal would be to really, really show that. Um, we can indeed, uh, while the technology to really do a one meter class optical telescope is, is there, the, the cost benefit ratio has to be justified by the community itself. I don't think we have done a lot of exercise towards this. Uh, and these, these things are initiated usually when there is a proposal coming from the, um, from the research community. And the third one on, on the cohesive or the cohesive approach to building our facilities, both ground and space. I fully agree with you that is the way we should be doing. Uh, we've had a small exercise here under this Apex Science Board of ISRO, which is the highest body that actually looks at science missions. And uh, we've drafted right now a vision document that doesn't totally blend in the ground-based program. I understand there is a similar um, vision being discussed in at least two different streams on the ASI as well as otherwise. And uh, I would hope in the next year or so, if those if these things mature, we will really have this cohesive, at least a, an attempt to really bring greater cohesion with regard to ground and space-based facilities, as well as what you mentioned in terms of across the band. Uh, that is uh, a little challenging. You know, if we were to do create a mechanism like the current decadal vision exercise going on in the US, in the National Academy of Sciences, which I, the other day I found, is on is called a meeting on the 14th of October, which is its uh, 15th sitting, I think. You see, they had so many sittings to really 
come converge on a decade revision document. Now, some part of it we could actually adopt that actually allows us to have this convergence. So these are important things, uh, but uh, we have some ways to go. So I haven't fully answered your question, Arun, but uh, hopefully given you some indications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, Dr. Srikumar, uh, yes. there are uh, some participants who have joined us through YouTube channel. Okay. And uh, they have some questions. So, Please. can I read out one question? Uh, the question is from Basavaraj Kagali. And he wants to know, can you tell us about recent X-ray and gamma ray observations of black holes? <laughs> um, I mean, they have been, Professor uh, Kagali, good to know that you're you're there and interested in some of these results. But uh, I mean, there have been a huge number of uh, things going on. I personally, I myself, have not been following it very well. I mean, uh, with AstroSat, as I said, we've been looking at uh, uh, primarily with the focus has been on uh, galactic uh, binary systems. And there have been many where we're looking at uh, QPOs from uh, um, black hole systems. Uh, we've been looking at uh, transient X-ray bursts from uh, neutron star systems and so on. But I right now don't have in, in my hand a list that would satisfy you. What I should say is we are putting together a small uh, um, report that's going to come in current science very soon. Um, we may hopefully before the fifth uh, year anniversary of AstroSat launch that is on the 28th of September. You'll have a quick summary of some of the important results. So I would we will make sure we'll send that to you if you're not able to get to it. Is that all right? Thank you. Uh, there is one more question from Nagaraja Kamsali. Okay. So he wants to know why no AstroSet satellites from IIA so far except AstroSet? AstroSet is a running satellite. It's still uh, just going to complete five years this September. And IA has been deeply involved in it. You know, it's provided one of the best instruments on board. Um, so we are really in the middle of it. And what we should have done by now is at least uh, outline the mission after AstroSat. I mean, way back in 2011, I think we started a series of discussions called Beyond AstroSat that uh, we used to have at, in spurts and occasionally every few years or so. And some of it has led to some of the points that are some of the concepts that we discussed. And clearly now the follow-up to the UV program, as I mentioned earlier, is a, is a proposal led by the Indian School of Astrophysics, Colin Sist. Uh, Director IA is uh, leading this effort. And we believe this is a very exciting program. And I'm sure at some point you will hear that from uh, Dr. Anapurni with regard to the details on it. So currently we are at an early phase of evaluation of these proposals. So we hope these things will mature very, very soon. Aruna, uh, if time permits, I can have a comment or question. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Sikumar, for your uh, nice talk, for the overview. I have one comment, actually, it is more relevant to what Arun was uh, pointing it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Optical telescope in space, I think Hinode is a, a great example. The Japanese, uh, being Japanese, always inventive, and it has uh, made a lot of discoveries, actually. So it's still an uh, you know, optical a telescope in space is not a bad idea <laughs> and in the context of in the context of uh, synergy with ground and space again i think solar is uh, showing the way uh, there are major major you know uh, high quality papers comes today uh, when this is actually done uh, with the combination of uh, space data and ground based the highest possible resolution is only possible from ground uh, in conjunction with then, uh, you know, if you want to look at the higher layers of the atmosphere, you need to look at uh, X-rays and UV. So this coupling of the solar atmosphere, if people are working on uh, synergy is absolutely necessary and which is happening very, very regularly for quite some time now. Yeah. Very true. I fully agree with that. But, but as I mentioned, the, 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 the role, the, the process of creating a justification for such an optical telescope in space is an exercise for the community to really come up with, isn't it? So sure. work sure. on it, justify it, and uh, if there is adequate justification, can proceed. Of course, um, yeah. I mean, at least in recent times, we have been noticing the, the real need to very strongly justify uh, big missions in space. So uh, there's, there's a greater need to really, com compared to earlier days, 
to really put that on paper in very clear terms, including the user community and so on. So, but I'm sure it can be done, and that's what we should be involved in, trying to create a series of white papers that justify and, uh, and sort of argue at some level the cost benefit of actually having such facilities in space. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Aditya also has an optical chronograph. So, <laughs> yeah. But when you look at, uh, when you're looking at uh, large optical telescopes of, when I say meter class, that's true. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, many issues, uh, and that has to be really taken into account. In fact, that has been a recent problem with the Japanese uh, Solar Sea mission also. They wanted to have a, uh, you know, a meter class optical telescope and a UV spectrograph, but eventually the meter class uh, optical telescope has been uh, taken off from the uh, you know, list. So it's now only a UV spectrograph mission. Okay. Solar Sea has been reduced to a, a one payload mission. Okay. Actually, sir, this is Padmakar Parihal. Yes, but uh, actually, uh, uh, my uh, um, actually, it's it's something like question or comment, uh, uh, whatever you can think of. Say uh, the space and ground-based astronomy are equally important. There's no doubt, uh, but we should not be actually uh, uh, um, in the process of uh, working on both. It should not be killing one right. So, for example, IA is uh, known for its ground-based astronomy, and uh, we have many observatories, many, many field stations. But now it looks like IA is more deeply involved in the space programs rather than the ground-based activities. So uh, we have to make sure that both activities go hands, uh, hand in hand. Uh, it's not happening that we are moving forward in one, but getting other. And I agree. I think it's uh, certainly, but you know, both are important and both, uh, both are important roles to play. And I think this comes back to Arun's point and maybe what Dipankar also said, that we really need to ask ourselves if there is a cohesive planning issue and there is a certain pocket of money in the country, we should ask ourselves what is the best way to use that money. And today, because different departments are independently doing the planning, uh, things are not necessarily synchronized in that sense or uh, synced in a manner where effective utilization of funds uh, would be better if we really sync that together. So I, I'm sure uh, as with any competitive system and we go when the department has to compete for the same pot of money, we will come up with good justification under which both can coexist and uh, only the very deserving ones get funded so that uh, money is optimally utilized. Sikma, let my, let me mention one uh, example where this lack of planning uh, seems evident. At least to me, I don't know if this is actually true. Okay. Uh, take the case of Daksha. Now, Daksha will able will be able to localize the source only uh, not very uh, 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 not very. There is some error uh, circle, which is uh, I'm not sure what the number is, but you will not know exactly where it is. But once this alert is out. There are a lot of people outside India who can target and actually observe the source, try to localize it, and get uh, you know papers out. Okay. But we don't have a system to follow up from Daksha's alerts, right? Okay. Uh, as far as I know, that is correct. Yeah. Now, if right. you so you will lo lose out on GRVs, you'll lose out on a lot of interesting sources, transients, uh, uh, basically in gamma rays. So optical follow-ups also need, needs to be sort of planned. Uh, so I don't know what, what what's the sort of thinking there. No, first of all, first of all Daksha is still under consideration. I been having we've been having regular discussions with the team with regard to because it is a it has a certain window of opportunity to really fly. It has to really move very quickly. Um, has to be synced at some level with the next. Uh, uh, next um, run of LIGO, and so that's very important. Um, so naturally, as part of that process, we really need to really ask if we were to see and, and generate alerts, what is our follow-up plan? Now, we have this 70-centimeter telescope in, in Hanley for uh, the growth telescope. It is a good example of systems that you could, in principle, put in place under which we can have rapid follow-up with some of them for other transients, as we have discussed. Um, we may have only partially succeeded in some of this in the past because of sometimes because of coordination. But clearly, for a transient uh, driven mission like Naksha, that has to be in place. 
We haven't yet really reached that, and partly because we believe it's doable if you really want to do it. But the, the larger question, I suppose, is should that be also considered under the funding uh, or the requirement as a ground segment for of Daksha? As of now, we're not considering that. With our, with our understanding that that funding would come from elsewhere, but it would be seen as a necessary component to strengthen the science that can come from Daksha. Uh, another, uh, this is an unrelated point. You mentioned uh, terahertz. I'm not, I probably didn't pay attention to the slide very carefully. What is this sort of science? It's, it sounds very interesting. Uh, is there anything that is being planned and what are the, what is the kind of science that's being targeted here? Okay, so this is being planned in two phases. The first phase primarily only targets the um, few hundred gigahertz band, 325 and 425, I think I don't know exactly what the numbers. And this allows us to really look at this uh, transitions of the carbon monoxide molecule um, in the gigahertz bands, uh, which have been used by, for example, the CFA survey of uh, Thaddeus, Tame, Tom Dame and others. Uh, as a continuation of that from a different longitude from here. Now, that is mostly a, a, a sort of a standard observing program that has been planned, but the idea really is to build on that and then go to the 450 gigahertz and higher bands to really pursue carbon-carbon uh, transitions. Now, I so the idea, and then finally, it will be part of this Event Horizon Telescope for imaging and so on. So. So the, there is a small writer being put together based on this January meeting. Um, also Ramesh at Adada is actually doing that now. Uh, and maybe it's one of those things we should really circulate in the community so we can actually have a broader discussion on this. I will certainly bring that up with him to really so that a larger, wider set of people can be part of this discussion uh, as this moves forward. Thank you. So, yeah, I this, just wanted yeah. to add one thing to the comments on uh, synergy. Um, I think uh, when AstroSet was planned, I think uh, the 3.6 DOT telescope was also in the planning. And uh, so the larger picture was that the multi-wavelength uh, aspect of AstroSat along with the optical uh, from observations from 3.6 meter DOT, as well as the radio observations from GMRT will have a good uh, wavelength coverage all through was the expected thing. So right now, the AstroSat is operational as well as 3.6 meter DOT is also operational. Uh, so that is uh, sort of establishing a synergy. But at the same time, I should also point out that these are very big missions and uh, uh, very big projects as such. So what the hurdles you face in the, these will be kind of quite different. So Sometimes it's not clearly possible to, you know, complete the wish list by the time one gets up, the, uh, uh, up and operational, the other would be slightly lingering behind or, you know, teething problems, etc. So uh, in general, it is, it is definitely looked for and it is done. And um, uh, in that process, sometimes you, one lags behind the other. So, but in general, when the project is getting approved, synergy is one of the main things which which is one looks for actually. Whether you can do everything end to end within the country, uh, country's accessibility. Oh, very true. I think you're right. Uh, the three point six was seen as a different ground component of that. Um, but from this experience, I think one of the things we need to, as we look at future programs, is to really realistically try to see what could be impediments, what, is, what are the kind of things that prevent us from doing it. In my view, one of the big issues is, uh, is this coordination. We really need to have a model that actually works where ease of coordination happens under which uh, even the existing facilities can be optimally used. Uh, these are things we can indeed do, um, and, but then the larger program of trying to build a new facilities has to be very well justified and argued so that is effective and when the time comes we can actually make it. So, I agree. Yeah, I also have a comment on this. Uh, in fact, the timing is important. And in fact, I was trying to uh, push the students here. And as you rightly pointed out, the students should uh, pave the way because they can handle this kind of multi-wavelength data quite uh, easily. Uh, for the earlier generation, it's probably more learning curve. So, uh, in fact, Anupama was uh, evaluating all the 90 proposals yesterday. Maybe she can comment how many uh, <laughs> you have approved <laughs> for 3.6 meter index cycle. So this is going to start in two weeks. So I'm actually looking forward 
And I, I hope uh, some proposals are there for joint observation. Yeah, maybe Anupama can comment because she was evalu evaluating all the proposals. <laughs> Yeah. So, I have one question related to uh, uh, the sub millimeter, uh, six meter telescope project. What you mentioned. So yeah. we have been we have been hearing about the sub millimeter observation from Hanley for I think more than decades, really? and, and things are not moving. So what is the reason for delay? Is it, is it telescope which is very complex to be built? Uh, the detector uh, uh, money. Is, I look. It looks like money is not. Uh, but you know all much, but why the delay is? I, I mean, I only know about a sub-millimeter program that was discussed maybe about 20 years ago when Eman Dave had come from NASA Goddard and was at PRL for some time, he was starting some development and the had given a fair amount of resources for initiating that, which then didn't go very far because he, he had left the program. Uh, there's been uh, uh, a different level of activity at RRI, but beyond that, I'm not aware of anything. Only, only in recent times, maybe I think in the last years, there's been an interest, uh, in an independent interest at the Space Application Center to look at these things, uh, because terahertz, uh, this is terahertz imaging, terahertz uh, sensing, terahertz detection, etc., of uh, multiple applications, and. Uh, there was a group that was interested, and um, he, and uh, and a young engineer from there was at CFA as part of some other program, and then uh, the dialogue crept up, and uh, uh, was Dr. T.K. Sridharan, that many of you know, who is at CFA, was uh, very encouraging and actually initiated these discussions, under which we are now moving at a fairly good pace. I believe this is a great good opportunity that would move faster than the earlier efforts, if there were any, I'm not aware of those. But clearly, uh, this is a unique opportunity, and I really hope that the, if the MOU, et cetera, gets signed, as you know, there are always some difficulties in getting those processes finished quickly, but the technical teams are ready to proceed rather quickly. Um, there are technology challenges when we get to the SIS detectors, the, the, the design of the telescope itself for a six meter class, there are some elements, but um, engineers from CFA, along with our uh, engineers from SAC and other places would be part of that. And uh, colleagues who have experience in this, our astronomy colleagues from JFR, RRI, et cetera, will all be part of that discussion as well. So uh, I believe in Patmanagar, this will move faster than earlier. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's very good, sir. And uh, the, the, this, this Telescope will be similar to SMA or uh, different from uh, SMA? That is a question. Uh, SMA is what uh, CFA has suggested, but then the CFA has also said SMA was designed many years ago. It is certainly worthwhile to have another look at it. SAC has done its own independent design. And one of the first things we need to do as a joint program would be to actually review the design of the telescope uh, structure and other related issues. Yeah. So we have to we have to take a re-look at it. Yeah. So, uh, if there are no questions, then uh, are there any questions? I, I think I'm we had a very interesting talk and a lot of uh, uh, very interesting discussions. And uh, uh, yes, anybody wanted to ask something? Yeah, uh, I had a question. This is only one. Okay. Uh, yes. So I want to ask that uh, uh, what are the uh, possibilities of CubeSat uh, satellites and how students can be trained in the field so that uh, like uh, some CubeSat satellites could be launched which can monitor some targets uh, which can follow up uh, some targets for extensive uh, long period which can't be done with big instruments. Very important point. I actually had a slide on it which I took it out because I had some difficulty <laughs> uh, putting in the contents there. We have not fully utilized the CubeSat platform. I, I think that is indeed true. And the CubeSat platform is an exciting platform to do a lot of science quickly, at low cost, and for specific objectives like what you indicated. So um, there is a rethinking of that also here at uh, ISRO. I, I mean, at least I know one group that's now involved in re-examining how to involve 
um, public and private partners in the in a, in a possible small satellite and CubeSat. Um, so at this stage, I don't have enough concrete things to tell you what is coming up, but I do believe that is right now under discussion for uh, how to enable a platform like that, wherein we are not trying to build a satellite. We actually want to say use a kit and move forward with the, trying to do the science we want to do from a platform. Of that type. So my suggestion would be there are proposals that are thought out that are part of a CubeSat to send it to us. No harm. We will look at it. And, uh, and uh, that might trigger us to do some things that we wouldn't do otherwise. So please do that. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, I have a yeah. question. Yeah. yeah, it's from Blue. Uh, so the terahertz facility that is being planned in Hanley, so can it be considered as a precursor for the proposed CMB Bharat mission to detect yeah. CMB? Uh, CMB Bharat so mission is... Space I know, I know. CMB Bharat is an independent proposal. There are commonalities in terms of detector design that goes with CMB Bharat. Mm -hmm. However, CMB Bharat has a whole new set of challenges. Um, and the, and right now, the diff most the biggest difficulty we see with CMB Bharat in India is we do not have a, a, a lead institution outside the source system that is willing to get deeply involved in some part of the technology component at least. Uh, and that is an important part. And number two, of course, is the costing is high. The, there are many elements that still requires, you know, the same pilot has a lot of similarity to the core mission that European Space Agency have put up. Yes, so yes. Enormous amount of technical challenges. Mm -hmm. We need a lot more discussion on how we will do the joint issue along with academic institutions to really realize it. We have not moved very far on it, but uh, so right now they're not linked, but they could be, there could be gains in the same pilot from the effort mm -hmm. to now put it into the, into the terrorist mission, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I, I think we had enough of uh, many questions. It was a very interesting talk and a lot of discussions. And I think it has uh, uh, grown a lot of interest among the younger students. I can see many young students have a lot of questions to ask. Um, but uh, today, I think we will return our thanks to Dr. Shri Kumar for a very interesting talk. And uh, with this, we would like to conclude today's meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Shri Kumar. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.